If you're like me, you might look at the week's worth of news on the back and forth, on again, off again, national eviction moratorium with a raised eyebrow and a lot of questions. First of all, how is the federal government doing any of this? How is the federal government telling landlords they are legally banned from booting people who don't pay their bills, deadbeats and squatters from their property? And even if the federal government can do that, how is any of this possibly the domain of the CDC? They're the Centers for Disease Control, not the Centers for Rent Control, or in this case, the Centers for Rent Elimination. And why have the politics totally reversed. Why has Joe Biden gone from saying he has absolutely no authority to be the country's one and only ultimate landlord to switching and saying, okay, you got me. Rent is banned again. And if that sounds made up, well, that's because it is. But how it was all made up is very important to understand because of all the constitutional mockeries of the last year and a half, this one is among the biggest in the scale of its victims and among the harshest in its total lack of recourse or compensation for them. It's also an injustice of wide participation. It includes every branch of the federal government and our media institutions in a slam dunk contest of the Bill of Rights straight into the trash. Of all the corona lessons to learn and watch out for next time, this is probably the most understated one. So let's first back up to how this dunk fest got started way back in March of 2020 in the early coronavirus scramble with the first stimulus bill called the CARES Act. Congress banned evictions on limited properties to which the federal government at least had some stake or claim. They banned evictions on properties with federally backed mortgages or of tenants receiving federal housing aid until the end of August 2020. But that move was limited in its coverage, of course. Only about a quarter of apartment buildings or other multifamily units in the country have a federally backed mortgage. And of course, not everybody receives federal housing assistance. So this bill was minimal in stopping evictions for non-payment. There were proposals in Congress to try to ban all evictions outright, but Congress could never agree to that, and so those proposals stalled. With Congress's inaction, frustrated activists proposed a different method to achieve their ends. Hey, let's just have the federal bureaucracy do it. And so after Congress's initial ban expired, the CDC stepped in to do just that. And so in September of 2020, the CDC just said, hey, uh, no more evictions anywhere anymore, at least for non-payment reasons. And if you do evict any deadbeat tenants, you landlords are going to face fines of up to $100,000, and I don't know, maybe even a year in prison, too. Ostensibly, this move was to alleviate a financial mess, but of course, federal bureaucrats don't often clean messes up. They more often make them, which is exactly what this order did. It offered no way for landlords to recoup that unpaid rent. It also offered no additional assistance for renters to pay that rent, though there were existing rental aid programs that shockingly were not efficient in distributing money and experienced long delays. So in effect, this order simply delayed the time at which landlords can collect the rent that they're owed, meaning landlords are left to try to collect their earnings in bulk down the line. And if your tenant isn't good for a thousand bucks in September, odds are he won't be good for 4,000 bucks in January either. So the same problem is just compounded and extended. It isn't fixed. It's actually harder to solve in bulk later than it would be at its proper time. And how is any of this the CDC's role? Well, we'll get to the bulk of that justification more in a minute, but the CDC says it can do this through the Public Health Service Act, federal law that usually gives the CDC decontamination power at contaminated sites that are public health hazards. Despite that suspect reasoning, this can of crap has just been kicked down the road ever since. The CDC extended the moratorium upon Biden's free and fair and fortified inauguration, and it was extended again in March and extended once more in June. Throughout that time, legal challenge to the eviction ban had been working its way through the courts. In May, a federal judge struck it down as unconstitutional. Biden's Justice Department appealed. The Supreme Court took up the case in July and said, yeah, this is a bunch of unconstitutional crap, but the CDC's eviction ban is set to expire in a couple weeks, so whatever. We're just going to let it play out and then it's Congress's problem to deal with after that. More on that gutlessness in a minute. But all of that gets us to the political theater of the last few weeks. Biden had originally said that his hands were tied by the Supreme Court decision and that he would allow the eviction moratorium to expire. The Supreme Court was clear. Biden said it would exceed his authority to extend the ban. 
If there's anything to be done about this, it is Congress's job, not his. But the problem for him and the eviction ban activists is, just like before, Congress isn't going to do anything about it, at least in any traditional legislative sense. In a ridiculous theatrical sense, though, Congress did plenty about that. At least one particular congresswoman, Cori Bush, who, among others, organized a multi-night Capitol step sleepover to protest the supposed injustice of landlords actually getting paid for the use of their property per the contracts that their tenants signed. But no, none of that matters. Because housing is a human right. So your property rights be damned. You don't have a right to your property. Instead, I have a right to your property and I get the government's forceful hand to back me up. That's not just a constitutional betrayal. That is a constitutional reversal. Every bit is nonsensical as saying political censorship is a human right. But that will be her next sign very soon. Other notable human rights apparently include Oreos and Ruffles, paid for by the U.S. taxpayer and campaign donors, as well as six figures worth of private security to keep her safe because her vending machine provisions must be protected from you peasants who, of course, aren't worthy of such security for yourselves. I'm going to make sure I have security because I know I have had attempts on my life. So if I end up spending 200000 if I spend 10, 10, 10 more dollars on it, you know what? I get to be here to do the work. So suck it up and defunding the police has to happen. We need to defund the police and put that money into social safety yeah, you know, a charitably donated $200,000 could probably cover a lot of past due rent, but that too, apparently, is none of our business. Voluntary and charitable care for each other won't get us out of this mess. Only theft from you will to pay for the rest of your property that they're also stealing. And it would be hypocrisy if these people had any claim of loyalty to principle or process, but of course they don't. And so naturally, their proposed solution was simply to ignore the principle and the process. And so top Democrats urged Biden, you know what? Screw the Supreme Court. Screw the Constitution. Just extend the moratorium again and make John Roberts come out and settle it with one of those fistfights or push-up contests you're always going on about. And then within days, moderate, principled, champion of normalcy Joe Biden once again did the puppet work of his activist, extremist, anti-Constitution masters. And he totally reversed himself. Did I say that my hands are tied? Because I meant that my hands are at your command. And if you guys say tear up the Constitution and flip the double birds to the Supreme Court, well, that is exactly what my hands will do. But with moderation, normalcy, dignity, and absolutely no mean tweets, of course, because as we all know, it's not radical authoritarianism unless there's a tweet with random capitalizations and misspellings. Well, how in the hell is this happening? You might be wondering. I thought the Supreme Court said all of this is unconstitutional. And yes, they did, but only on tame, deferential, non-specific technical grounds, not on thoroughly explained matters of constitutional principle. The 5-4 decision Kavanaugh wrote and the court issued was one page long. And all it says is, yeah, we agree with the lower court that the CDC has no authority to do this, but since they're stopping in a few weeks, and since rental assistance payments are going out, we're just going to punt the question and allow it all to expire naturally. And that reasoning is, one, incredibly weak, but two, self-defeating, since it says something is wrong, but then leaves a path for that wrong to continue. Just because an injustice has expired doesn't mean that we don't address that injustice. We still explain why it was wrong so that it doesn't happen again. But the Supreme Court dabbles in this sort of puntery all the time. There were several cases of other coronavirus and lockdown policy that the court dismissed as moot simply because the rules were revised or had expired. And even though it's not always the majority's reasoning, it is a common feature of the Chief Justice's reasoning. In a case brought by New York Catholic Churches last fall against Andrew Cuomo's occupancy limits, a dissenting John Roberts said that there was no need for the Supreme Court to intervene because the restrictions in question had already been revised. In a separate free speech case in March, John Roberts was the sole dissent refusing to protect a college student who was banned from speaking about his religion and distributing literature on his public university campus on the basis that the dispute was moot because that student had graduated and the restrictions against him no longer existed. As though the question of whether the injustice stopped 
is more important than the nature of the injustice itself or what made it injustice in the first place. If someone steals your property, the legal or moral remedy is not, oh, well, I guess they stopped stealing. So now the question is moot. Get back to me if they start stealing again. No, the question is, what about the stealing was wrong? What about the stealing was illegal? What about the stealing was immoral? And what standards can we set so that nobody can repeat that same theft tomorrow? And in this evictions moratorium case, those questions are just as important because we are talking about stealing. We are talking about theft. We are talking about federal bureaucrats deciding on a whim that you as a landlord are not, in fact, entitled to your property. And that instead, they get to direct your use of it and your earnings from it or to erase them if they see fit. Kavanaugh said in the Supreme Court decision that the CDC exceeded its authority, but exceeded its authority how? Statutorily? Constitutionally? That's an explanation that would be key in stopping this nonsense going forward. As I mentioned earlier, the CDC says they have statutory authority to do this based on federal law that allows them to compel disinfection at sites of public hazard, but that's not what's happening here. This isn't fumigation of an infection site, as the statute describes, it is broad suspension of every rental contract in the country, whether the apartment is infected or not. And that's just the statutory question. What about the constitutional one? In his decision, Kavanaugh said that Congress could extend this eviction moratorium with clear and specific legislation, but could they? How could they? Why? Could they? In what context can Congress simply strip us of our property rights that the 5th and 14th Amendments protect? When private property is seized for public use, which is generally what's happening here, the 5th Amendment says the property owners must be justly compensated, which they currently are not. And how is any of this the domain of the federal government at all? Whether Congress does it, or the CDC, or any other alphabet agency does it, on what constitutional authority is the federal government acting? And I know nobody cares about the redheaded step amendment, the 10th, but it is a constitutional provision just as valid as any other, and it says powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states and the people. And the seizure and suspension of private contracts for private housing units is not a power that is constitutionally delegated to the federal government. So in any proper reading of the Constitution, not Congress, not the CDC, not anybody in DC has the authority to do this. And when the Supreme Court abdicates its job of making that explanation, of answering those questions, of giving clear definition to what the Constitution allows and doesn't allow in this specific circumstance, they give the green light to the ongoing abuse. Oh, as long as they stop, it's fine. No, it isn't. Because if you don't explain why they must stop, they don't stop. And so Biden didn't stop. Biden acknowledges what he's doing is illegal. He acknowledges he's not going to win in court. But he says that while this latest extension is being challenged in court, his illegal move at least buys some time for the moratorium to continue and the government to keep dishing out its funny money while the printers are working overtime. In other words, since the Supreme Court didn't say clearly why they can't do this, the case will just get litigated again. And all the Supreme Court did with its shrugs was create more opportunity for the constitutional turncoats to continue their betrayal. But don't worry because it's a virtuous betrayal. It's a benevolent betrayal. It's a betrayal of good guys doing good things, which is apparently our media perspective, because we have had every branch of the federal government participating in this constitutional betrayal. The Supreme Court failed to apply it. The president is failing to follow it and enforce it. And Congress has failed to pass any laws in accordance with it or to protect it. Congress could have passed a law at any time to stop this nonsense immediately. But they, too, were too busy cranking a money printer with one hand and pointing a finger with the other. But that is not to understate the final betrayal from the fourth institution, the press whose sole job it is to watch out for exactly this sort of betrayal, exactly this sort of abuse of power. But instead, we're getting headlines like, conservatives are freaking out about the eviction moratorium, as though only partisans could have any questions about the constitutional shredding. Biden shows he's ready to make drastic moves in the COVID-19 fight, even if he's not sure they're legal. 
Biden's novel evictions defense. Maybe it's illegal, but it's worth it. Drastic and creative are not synonyms for moral, legal, or good. We could imprison every single person in this country right now to lower the murder rate, and it probably would work, but we might call such a move an abuse of power that's worthy of some scrutiny and investigation, not creativity to be admired or celebrated. So everybody, the court, the Congress, the presidency, and the press, they are all in on this slam dunk contest. And we're not talking weak two-handers barely above the rim. We are talking globetrotter-style acrobatics, reverse dunks, windmills, crossovers, trampoline backflip slams of the Constitution straight into the trash by the very people sworn to uphold and protect it. And the temptation can often be to blame the document itself or its philosophy for that failure as though this piece of paper is supposed to spontaneously animate and pull out tactical gear and protect you from this sort of abuse. But the plain fact of the matter is, the Constitution is simply that. It's just ink on paper. It doesn't matter if it's the perfect word of God himself. If we as those sworn to it don't make a serious commitment to upholding it, it might as well be incoherent nonsense. It might as well be actual toilet paper. It only has effect when we give it effect. Thomas Sowell phrases it better than I do. In other words, the Constitution cannot protect you if you don't protect the Constitution. Peacefully, Susan, with your votes against anyone who violates it, these people who want power don't stop unless they get stopped. And I emphasize peacefully in part to emphasize there is nothing peaceful about what these people are doing. There is nothing peaceful about stealing people's property. There's nothing peaceful about locking people in their homes. There is nothing peaceful about forcing injections. Peacefulness, just like any other of their purported principles, isn't. It's just a means to an end. And so as force increasingly becomes their preferred means to their ends, be aware of that disconnect. Peace and non-aggression are just what they insist upon you, not what they actually believe in or uphold. Contemplate accordingly. Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Minds. That is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.